Hi, it's J.V. Vela. I, along with my friend, mentor, colleague, Juar Wizard, Mr. Mark Bennett. Hey, J.V. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So today we have Mark here for this, because I've, I've wanted him to come on the show for so long. I would, he is the jury, jury wizard. Um, he's known throughout the country, throughout the state, at least locally, as one of the finest defense attorneys around uh, and willing to help drop knowledge bombs, uh, particularly with that I have found interest in juries and jury selections. Yeah, Mark, well, thank, thank you for you. coming. Well, thanks for having me, JV. It's my pleasure. So let's talk about juries, okay? Yeah. It's what it's all first about, thing, isn't it? How are you approaching a jury? So, so first things first, um, you have a case. Where are you starting to prepare for? So, like when I first take the case. When you first, well, so, let, let's say you've taken it and, you, and it's already yours at this point. Okay. So, so the first thing that I want is jury instructions. I want to figure out how the jury is going to be instructed at the end of the case, based on what the charge is and maybe what my defense is, because everything else working backwards through the trial is based on what the jury instructions are going to be. You can't know what your closing argument is going to be until you know what the jury instruction is going to be. You can't know what evidence you want to present until you know what the jury instruction is going to be. You can't know how you want to cross-examine the state's witnesses, what opening statement you want to make, or how you want to vordire the jury until you know what the jury instructions are likely to be. What if you don't know what things are going to come out during the course of a trial? And so you might find yourself having one jury charge with a scenario A, jury scenario, jury charge with scenario B, jury charge with scenario three, or are you just not looking at your case well enough? No, it might happen that you say, okay, I think we're going to be able to put on enough evidence to show self-defense, to get a jury charge on that. But I'm not sure. I think we might have enough evidence that we can get a jury charge on defense of a third party. But I'm not sure. So I have all of those possibilities in my mind. Okay, if it goes this way, then this is what, this is what I'm going to argue. <laughs> if it goes that way, this is how I'm going to cross-examine the cops. Ideally, this is how everything is going to shake out, and, and uh, this is what the jury instruction is going to be. Are you typically writing out your jury charges? Now, I know we have some language that are, that are, that is, we hate to, we want to stay away from the boilerplate, but the instructions regarding, I don't know, some of the boilerplate language. Well, okay. yeah. I mean, and, are you and, writing them out? And, or you? you know, most judges are just going to follow whatever is in the charge bank. Sure. So that's, that's one source is the charge bank. And I'll look at that and say, okay, here, you know, here's what's in the charge bank. And that's sort of our, our baseline. Now, how can that be better? Well, how could I improve that? What kind of objections could I make when we get to the charge conference to convince the judge to use different language? What other language could I propose? The state bar has their jury charges, and they're better written than the, the Harris County Charge Bank jury charges. When I say they're better written, they're easier to understand. And even when jury charges are written the best they can possibly be, linguists have found that jurors just don't understand them. About half of jurors understand about half of the jury charge, even when they're written as clearly as possible. Are you looking at the jury charge and crafting closing arguments before you're even considering voir dire? Crafting closing arguments, I would say no. I'm not actually saying, okay, you know, I'm going to argue this, and then I'm going to argue that, and then I'm going to argue the other. Uh, but I am looking at the jury charge and sort of thinking about how, what language from the jury charge would be most helpful to my theory before I even get to voir dire. Are you thinking of instructions that could possibly come up, and are you thinking of I mean, I guess, and are you writing those out? I'd, I'd, I'd assume that you're thinking of in some sort of any special issues or instructions that might come out during the course of the trial, and then are you, I'd imagine then are you using them to, incorporating them into crafting a voir dire? Sure, yeah, so, so I have my idea for what I think the jury charge is going to look like, or what ideally it will look like, and that might include special issues, defenses, uh, definitions that, that might be important to me keeping the government, government from proving their case. I might be able to say, look, you know, here's what the definition of this is, and they haven't proven that. Government disregards this a lot of the time, and, a lot, and I've actually looked at a lot of jury charges that don't define things like um, individual. Right? So a, a person includes an individual. What's an individual? An individual is a living human being. How about that? You know, additionally, I recently, speaking of the government having to not only plea but prove, uh, and plea correctly, uh, Corey Roth just recently had a, a directed verdict, and I saw him after the, I believe it's a directed verdict, I saw him after the first day, <coughs> and I'm telling you, he was bummed. 
He was, <laughs> he was worn down. He had just been fighting all day. Things had gone really well for him. It kind of tanked off towards the end. And I saw him afterwards, <clears throat> and we're sitting there, and he's, he's in his computer, and he's trying to figure things out. I said, what are you, what's going on? He said, you know, uh, they're, the way they pled it, I'm not sure that the proof is, is matches up to how they pled it. Right. And it had right. to deal with telephone communication. Harassment, right? Harassment, yeah, right? Yeah, so, so they alleged telephone harassment, and then they had evidence of other sorts of harassment, like cell phone or texts and, and emails. And boy, if they plead telephone harassment, they sure have to prove telephone. We can make them prove telephone harassment. I say they sure have to if, the, if Corey was paying attention. And if the defense lawyer's not paying attention, government gets away with all sorts of stuff. But yeah, he, got, he convinced the judge that they hadn't proven their case. So he didn't even have to put on a case. He didn't even have to argue it to anybody but the judge. And the judge granted a directed verdict. And he said that you helped him out on that. He said that he said that you were you were the you were the the whisperer behind. I I I may have imparted a little That's bit what of, he said. little bit of wizardry to 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 him. Yeah, I was I I so I've been trying to to help with a dozen voir dires this year. I'm trying to help pick 12 juries just because I don't get in there enough to do it. I have a low volume practice and I don't get in there enough to think okay, you know, what you know, to see all of the possibilities of things that can go wrong and things that can go right. So I so I helped Corey pick a jury on that and and I started hearing the the prosecutor making mistakes about what he had pled compared to what he was telling the jury. And I went over and I whispered in Corey's ear, you, you object to this stuff. This is this. You need to hold them to their burden. And he did. Let's talk about that. You recently wrote a blog post. Uh, you should check it out, everybody. And I think it has something to do with the assistant, the, the district attorney's office failing to train these baby lawyers or these younger lawyers. Right in specifically or particularly on how they conduct or go about doing their Vordire. So Vordire is the most important part of the case. You win or lose a case in Vordire. Prosecutors get sloppy sometimes because they have, there's so much <coughs> proof that it doesn't matter really what happens in Vordire as long as they don't let on the people who are so strongly anti-government they're gonna vote against the government no matter what. So I've watched uh, several prosecutorial Vordires lately where I thought the, that the lawyers, and no, no criticism of them, these are young, enthusiastic, smart people with you know, well-educated, well good-looking people who should be able to knock it dead when they get up there and they already have the presumption of credibility that the prosecutor has. But they, they flubbed their, their voir dires, and I attribute it primarily to they're following scripts. They're following other people's scripts, and they don't understand the scripts. So they don't have the sort of training that we used to see in the DA's office where a young lawyer might be trying a case and, the, the, you know, the, and somebody with several more years of experience would be sitting second on the first couple of trials and saying, look, you know, try this, do this, do the other. Instead, we've got lawyers who have maybe a month of experience, who have somebody with maybe six months of experience sitting second. The person with six months of experience learned from somebody who had six months experience more than them, and there's no body of wisdom that's getting passed down right. on, on how to start persuading a jury in voir dire. I mean, this is to my client's benefit, obviously, but, but right. that's not all there is in the world, right? If on a particular client's case, I'm not gonna fuss about it, but we're members of the community as well. And what has made the Houston Criminal Defense Bar the best in the country is that we've had strong opponents. And if we don't have strong opponents, then we're going to slide downhill as well. So let's talk about getting voir dire together, right? Sure. Okay. Um, are you a fan of PowerPoint? If so, how? Are you a fan of demonstrative? If so, how? I am very much opposed to PowerPoint. Okay. Or dire. So human being, yeah, and the, the, first of all, the theory behind power, one theory behind PowerPoint is that people are so used to looking at the screen that we should feed them more time with the screen, right? Because that's how people are used to communicating. And I see the argument, but I think more importantly than the last 20 years of people watching screens is 150,000 years of being human and sitting around a campfire listening to stories or having people make eye contact and talk to us and listen to us. And I think that with being on screens all the time that we're losing that. And I, people, I find, are hungry for it. Jurors want us to talk to them. They don't want to look at something on the screen. They want to have a conversation with us. And it's something that isn't a big part of, of modern life in the way that screens are. So I think we ought to get away from the, the screens in jury selection. I think there's a place for them in trial, uh, but I think get away from them in jury selection. I've seen you speak at CLEs, and you, do, you particularly do a phenomenal job on uh, your presentation. And, I, and you sent me a, one time you sent me this app and it was, um, 
Prezi, probably. Prezi, yes. So I've tried yes. that, and and it's the it, a CLE presentation can be scripted. Sure. And Prezi was really cool because it was like PowerPoint, except not linear slide, slide, slide. You'd have the big picture, and you could zoom in on different parts of it and move to move around to different parts. Uh, I've decided that that's not the best way to communicate in CLE either. I think that for CLE, that this, what we're doing here, just people talking to each other is much more effective for teaching. Do you say no to any imagery at all? No, no. I, in, in Vordire, I'll use uh, printed placards. Right? So I'll have a piece of law that I want to talk about in Vordire. The law of self-defense would be a good example. I'll have it printed on a two by three piece of cards of uh, a paper and then dry, dry mounted mm -hmm. on, uh, what do you call it? Um, foam core, on foam core. So I'll have, you know, I'll have some of these and I might have a, a box full of them where I can pull out something and, and stick it up there. That's one thing about PowerPoint is it's so sequential. You can't just say, okay, let's jump to slide number 17. If there were a system that would allow that, I might feel a little bit better about it because then we wouldn't have to follow, we wouldn't be following a script. We'd be putting up images to match what's going on. So that's what I'll do is I'll, I'll, pick, up, I'll pick up something that matches what we're talking about now. So it's not, the, the, you know, it's not on a screen. It's something physical. And it, people can tell that it has some, some weight and some heft. There's one court where I'm about to pick a jury in the next few months that has blackboards. And I saw blackboards <laughs> in the court and thought, oh, yeah, nice. this is really cool, right? right? Because, you know, think about when you were looking at people writing on things on blackboards. And you're probably a little younger I than, than blackboards. I remember the blackboards. I'm probably right? the last gen, yeah. Right? But, yeah. but yeah, so, so people, you know, we get into this the, and, you know, they say, you know, train in the same conditions that you're going to that you're going to fight in right so we because our brains get accustomed to something meaning something right to yeah, so our brains are accustomed to the blackboard meaning the teacher is going to tell us something and we're going to pay attention so these blackboards are just going to be a whole whole lot of fun and I, I had thought before i went to this court and saw the blackboards man i'd love to have a blackboard to take to the trial and if it works i'll i'll buy a couple and schlep them around with me. That's the other thing. You got to schlep those things around. I, know. I, know. You, I mean, you got to gonna have to go old school. I know. Well, I'll get a couple of law clerks to do the schlepping for me. You know, today, speaking um, about Vordire presentations and things in the courtroom, supposedly they're, they're going to spend 80 grand a courtroom. <laughs> I heard this today. To For, this... for electronics, right? Right. $80,000. I mean, imagine you, you could do your whole house for... for <laughs> I wonder what kind yeah, of system the they're gonna have, top right? Of the line, right? You can play right, some so music and somebody's, you know. <coughs> I hear they're gonna do yeah. holographic 3D. <laughs> right now. That's what I hear. Michael Jackson's gonna <laughs> right. get the argument yes, for the state. T Tupac is gonna come out too. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, eighty thousand no. dollars is insane. What are they thinking? <coughs> and you know, the other thing about this technology is it all becomes outdated so quickly. Right. You put in hard technology and. A year or two later, you need something new, like the equipment that they had in there. It was it was state of the art in 2001. How quickly did it become non state of the art? They had those big the uh, back right. rear projector TVs, right. right? Those were not state of the art three or four years later, and people you know people didn't use them. And now they've put in flat screens in the most awkward, terrible position. <sighs> I mean, if somebody, they work at all, it's like it's literally like somebody said, "Yeah, I want you to just go put a TV over there and put a TV over there, put a TV." Right. Look, if if Here's to whoever's in charge of fixing this courthouse and putting $80,000 of taxpayer money in that courtroom. Somebody better hire some feng shui expert or at least just somebody who has half a brain well, to or position them. Somebody who's picked a jury, perhaps. Yes. Right? Yes. Because you know, if you look at the way they're set up now, somebody looked at the courtroom and said, okay, well, clearly the judge over there, that's a very important person. And so we're going to have screens, everything directed toward that person. But but no, you know, the most important people in the courtroom at any moment are the people out in the audience. Um, the Let's, people, most important people who are ever in the courtroom are going to be the potential jurors out in the audience. Once they become jurors, the case is probably already decided. Let's talk about presence, okay? Um, there's an old, you know, the old, I guess, Dick DeGuerin, Rusty Harden, not Rusty Harden, I suppose, but the old Dick DeGuerin thing that I've been taught and growing up is you wear a, a like a blue suit and a and a white shirt and a plaid, a stri uh, not a plaid, a, a striped blue tie. And that's what you're supposed to wear and that's what it looks like and that's what you're supposed to do. I, I don't necessarily ascribe to that, but I do ascribe to a degree that they, you need to look a certain way 
what are your thoughts? I so I think you need to be you. Sure. Right. Yeah, you don't want right. to be uncomfortable right. because the jury can tell if you're uncomfortable. But other than that, I think you you want to meet their expectations of of what a lawyer looks like. And their expectations when when you know, Dick was coming up, I think that was their expectation was a navy suit, a white shirt, and a striped tie. I think their expectations are broadened a little bit now. I I don't I don't buy that you need to wear the same you know that same uniform now interestingly um, Robert Hirschhorn says wear something more casual for jury selection and then get into the power clothes oh, for the trial right right which makes right. a lot of sense because sure. you're trying to connect with the people during jury selection so if you're wearing your your khaki slacks and your your navy blazer during jury selection <coughs> a little bit dressed down not like I am now huh. you know in jeans but but a little bit dressed down you, it's easier for the jurors to connect to you you know, I'm trying to think of how one would do that in a one-day trial or a... Change, right, change after jury selection. They'd well, be talking about it. You could have your tie. You could say, you know, you could have your tie somewhere hanging and address it and say, when, when, once we get into six in the box or at this point, there's going to be six and we're going to, we're going to start this trial. Or, and there might be something. I don't yeah, know. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Maybe, you know, wear your, your Mr. Rogers cardigan for jury selection well, yeah, and then yeah, change it off. And then it's, your time, it's time to get That'd on. Be awesome. Time yeah. to change up. I don't, I don't, I've never tried to, uh, never picked a jury without a necktie and I don't well, know I that I would do that. Um, Let's talk about aesthetics. And so you talked about, you, you use these uh, foam cut out, nice cutouts that you want, no, no screens. Right. Do you use any other uh, items in your Vordar? Uh, I haven't, I mean, I would. If there were some, some prop that I thought was, was useful, I might, but. So I saw um, Robert Pelton one yeah. time at a CLE. Okay. And he was talking about presence in a jury and, the, and, and talking to people. And he said, well, why is it important? And he pulled, and he went into his bag, and he pulled out these chains, and they clanked, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was obviously for the CLE, but it, that stuck with me. And then he put that down, and then, well, why is something else? And then he pulled out, um, he pulled out a lighter, or he did something. And he had these things in his hand, yeah. and you could see it. I took that, and and I'd like to, and I've seen Todd Dupont. Yeah. Uh, we sometimes he'll 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 put something in Vordire and say. Every, you know, everything looks like a hammer, and when you're, everything looks like a nail when you're a hammer, right? And, and at the end, he'll have a, a handful of nails, right, and put it, or a ha holding a hammer. I've yeah. seen these things done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, have you ever used those, and what are your thoughts on things like nothing, that? Nothing physically metaphorical like that in jury selection, right? Because that's what it is. It's something physical that, that tells a story. I, I don't think it's a bad idea. I've just never felt the need. I use this block. It's a black block, sure. okay? And I have an image. I use PowerPoint, but <clears throat> very rarely do I put words. It's images. Okay. Okay? Yeah. And one of them is a scale of justice, and it's does, it's not, it doesn't start equal. It starts this way because this is where the presumption of innocence is and, and it stays here and never moves. Uh -huh. And on that image, there's a black cube, uh -huh. right? And, and that represents the presumption because it's deep and it's dark and, and, there's, and, 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 it's, and it's strong. And on the other end, the government has to put their own blocks, and, right? And it, has to, and it has to bring that presumption of innocence up. And I, it, during that, I'm holding my cube, and it's an obsidian cube. Yeah. Beautiful oh, nice. cube. And, and, I, and I bang <laughs> it around, and I spin it. And, and, and so <laughs> and, and, and in Vordire, people are like, this, this is deep, and it's dark. Yeah. And the only thing anyone else can presume in this life is death and taxes <laughs> and the presumption love it. of innocence. And I love it. And so and I, I sit it there, and, I, and it sits with me at, in the trial, and it never moves. And so... We seat the jury and then we do opens and close and if I don't and, and I play with it during the trial and it sits there uh, uh, and then I bring it in closing and I, and I did yeah, and did, yeah, did they yeah, pick it up? Yeah. I like it, man. I love it. I love I like it. But it. but I wouldn't steal it from you. That's your thing. But, yeah, but there's but, other so, things. So yeah, sure, sure. So a couple things you're doing there. Talking about wizardry, right? One is you're anchoring. You're anchoring the the idea of the presumption of innocence to this physical thing, which they can see, they can imagine touching, they can see it, and they can in their brains they can feel it in their brains because they sense its weight and its gloss, and they know that it feels cool because it's obviously made of some some sort of stone. obsidian, right? And they obsidian. love it. It's obsidian. And obsidian. They love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they love it. They're like ooh. From a volcano. Yes. Right? Yes. That's right. Yeah. Exactly right. Yes. So, the yeah. center of the earth. Yeah. 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 Yes. So so you're anchoring. 
anchoring this idea to this physical thing. And every time they see the physical thing, they're going to come back to the idea, right? And you're also dealing with their, their kinesthetic part of their brain, which is the part of our brain that, that feels things. And it doesn't just feel physical things. It feels emotions. It's the same part of, part of our brain. So you're, so you're, you're triggering these feelings in them and they're connected to you. And the, and it's this, 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 you know, this burden that's on the state and, and they, you know, you've, you've made it palpable. You've made it physical to them. And the, the state doesn't have anything to respond to that. They couldn't. So Mark has written about something that I've been a practitioner of for a number of years now. It's called loop theory, right? And pardon me, because I'm not the one, I'm not the author of this. You are. Uh, <laughs> But fortunately, we have the author this, nearby. <laughs> this is how I keep the loop open. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have, and that's the idea. So this, there's this idea that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but humans will try to go and finish the job at the fastest way possible to, uh, to save as much energy as we possibly can. Okay. And, and the second that that loop is closed, the second that they have found in their mind the most efficient way from A to Z, it's very, very difficult for, to... To reopen. To reopen. Right? Yes. Right. right. The okay. loop is closed. The job is done. We, our brains don't want to revisit it. Right? So, right. So, but during that time when it's open, our brains really want to close it. Right, so, so once upon a time, right? If I start telling a story once upon a time, then your brain is going to wait for... Happily right, ever right, after, right right? Right, right? right, right. So I start right. telling the story. So that's opening the loop. Once right. upon a time, happily ever after, we'll, we'll close the loop. Right. So, so what's the loop that you're opening with, the, so with your cube? It is something that I, that at, with the cube, the idea is this creates the interest in the beginning. Okay. And the idea is fine, everybody. If they think they can prove their case and, and, and lift this, this presumption, let me see them do it. Okay. Let's let no, let's 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 see if they can. Okay. And that entire time throughout the course of the trial, I'm holding it, and it's and and I'm not letting it go, or I'm playing with it, or if it's a, if it's a weak move, and and so the and, and when I come to close, I, I I literally bring it to the jury bar, to bar, and, and they're all most of the time they're just right, and you and you put it, and I and I at the end I say not today. They didn't do it today, right? And so yeah. I get to keep, I play a little keep away, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, but the, the idea of loop theory is amazing to me. And, and it's, uh, what are some ways that you keep or that you, can, uh, that you can talk about on how to keep that loop open? And how do you get it? How do you, you start with an anecdote? How do you? How do I? How do you open that loop? It depends, Or right? keep it open. Well, it, so it depends. So, I believe that the case is resolved by the end of opening statement. Okay. Generally, that that at the end of opening statement, you've got jurors who that every juror, whether they're going to admit it or not, because they're told that they're not supposed to do this, but every juror has an idea of what happened, and it's either guilty or not guilty. And if you have a majority of the jurors at the beginning, you're probably going to have a majority of the jurors at the end. And if you have a majority of jurors at the end, you're probably going to win the whole case. Okay. Right. Okay. What happens in the jury room? I mean. You know, every every human being is different, but generally, I think what happens in the jury room is the side with seven people on it bullies the side with five people on it to change their mind, or certainly the side with eleven people on it bullies the the holdout to change to change his or her right. mind. Right. Um, so I think that's how a trial goes, and everything else in between opening statement and uh, and the verdict is just. You're just playing. You're playing to keep the points that you have and to exploit your your adversary's mistakes. And you might gain a little bit by doing by exploiting your adversary's mistakes and by not making any yourself. This is what I remember you saying at some point in my life uh, to a large group of people um, that there are once that loop is closed, it's almost it's terribly difficult to reopen. But you you called it blockbuster evidence or or yeah blockbuster wow. evidence yeah right. wow that, right I'm impressed that I made that impression that, yeah, yeah yeah that's something that can blow the the open the loop back open and what would some of those okay so be? so blockbuster evidence is uh, it's a it's a fact that you so something against you right it's a fact that you can't rebut that changes things and that you didn't prepare the jury for in Vordire. So it's the confession that your guy made, where he definitely made the confession, and if he made this confession, then then you know he's guilty of this, and you didn't prepare the jury in Vordire for the fact that he may have made a confession and it may be false. 
right? Right. You didn't talk about false confessions in Vordar. You didn't talk about why somebody would say would say done something that he hadn't done. So yeah, so blockbuster evidence is that. So, you, so let's say that at the end of opening statement, you have eight jurors on your side and there are four on the state's side. You never know this, of course, right? Because, but, but there is some sort of split. You don't know what it is. At some point, the state offers this piece of evidence that you hadn't prepared the jury for. That can change your jurors' minds. Right. On the other hand, if you pro provide a piece of evidence that the state hadn't prepared the jurors for, that can change jurors' minds in your favor. Right. So that's one of the things that can change jurors' minds. The other is a loss of credibility. Right. But if you lose credibility, if right. you screw something up and you appear to be dishonest to the jury, you can lose a lot of jurors really fast. Or if you can exploit your adversary's mistakes so it appears to the jury that you're the, your adversary is not being honest with them, you can gain jurors that way. And that's playing for the fumbles. You know, this, uh, how do you maintain credibility with the jury? At the, uh, that's one of those questions like, well, the, the answer is just don't, don't lie, be dishonest. But it's, it's, more, it's harder than that. Yeah. So, so when we're talking about credibility, we're talking about there are lots of other words for, for what we're really looking for. We want them to follow us, right? We want to lead them. We want them to be attracted to us that is not repulsed by us. We want them to like us, right? So there are all these things for we want to have charisma, right? We want them to think that we're the person that they want to, whose story they want to follow, whose story they want to believe, right? So, and there are different components to this, and the study of charisma has taken a lot of smart people a lot of time, most of it funded by businesses, because businesses are interested in how leaders are charis charismatic and how that affects followers. So there's a lot of research out there on, on charisma, and there are lots of different ways to break it down. One of them that I like is uh, warmth or benef beneficence, which is sure. you know, having, a, having goodwill toward the people, and, and, and the other part is competence. So if the juror sees that I have their best interest at heart and that I'm competent, they're going to want to follow me. If, however, they at any point get the idea that I don't have their best interest at heart, they're going to just stop following me, and, they, and I can't get that back. How do you do that in a particularly... Um, uh, Kate, in a particular type of case where it's just terrible, it's a it's a it's a super aggravated sexual assault of a child, right? right? Or if it's a it's one of these rape cases, or it's a terrible allegation. How do you maintain? How are you going to maintain that? Well, you've got to be right, and you've got to be you've got to believe that you are right, because congruence is congruence is the important issue here, right? That that we what we do has to match what we're saying. And what we're saying has to match our eyes, and our eyes have to match our hand gestures, and our hand gestures have to match how our body is standing. Because the way that, that human beings detect lies is not any particular thing. It's not, oh, you know, I saw his pulse increasing in his temple, right. or he started to sweat. It's a mismatch in the signals that we get. People will be able to tell that you lie, not because of any particular signal, but because the signals start not to match. And they don't realize necessarily that your signals start to match. How do you make sure your signals match? Well, you tell your truth. How? And if your truth is, my guy did this, and boy, I'm just playing for the fumbles, I haven't tried any cases like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, that's, <laughs> by the time I get to trial, I usually have trial psychosis, where I believe that I'm right and that we're going to win the case, and that make sure that I'm congruent, that I don't believe anything other than the story that I'm telling. So you have to believe the story you're telling. So you've got the case, you've done the jury charge, you've, you've thought about, you've gotten your boards, your, your physical things, and now you're, do you think, look for particular types of jurors or particular types of individuals who you think would be good? I generally don't believe in demographic jury selection. I would rather have a conversation with a person than decide whether I want them on a jury based on cool, based on the job that they do, or the or their age, or their race, or how many kids they have. And in a case involving uh, sexual assault against young kids, I might not want a, a married man with young kids. I might want a divorced man with young kids mm -hmm. because the divorced man with young kids might be more sensitive to the possibility of false accusations, which is generally what the case is when I have a child sex case. It's always false allegations. Uh, uh, we have a call. I'd like to. I'd like to. Yes, yeah, so we'll put that on pause. I'd like to see how you go over the juror information cards and and or if there's any pointers that you'd like that you could shine on us. We got a phone call. Here we are. What's up, caller? Yeah, I would like to know how the jury wizard. Uh persuades jurors to take on his his view during jury selection. Re repeat that? What? How do I persuade uh, them to take I, on my, my how view? How do I persuade ah. them to take on his views? I mean, okay. that's, 
that's the whole game, right? Is getting the jurors to adopt my story. And the, the way to do that is to make it their story. Because if a jury tells me, oh, this is what the defense is, they're going to believe it. If I tell them this is what the defense is, then we're like, okay, lawyer telling us uh, what's best for his client. So the way to do that is to get the jury in jury selection to start suggesting possible defenses, given the facts as, as they're going to come out in a hypothetical situation, right? So you can't, in Harris County, there's this rule, it's not written down anywhere, but you can't talk about the facts. It's a nonsense rule, but most of the judges follow it, like lots of nonsense rules they follow. Why is it a nonsense rule? It's not written down anywhere. It's just, it's not a rule. That we can't talk about the facts. That you can't talk about the facts is not a rule. Don't you get into it being, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a conclusory answer. It, 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 it's, it's asking for... It's a, a improper commitment question. Improper commitment is, question. Is, is the objection, and certainly if you, if you bring in the facts, you could be trying to commit the jury improperly, but you're not necessarily doing that. Right. And you can't and you can improperly commit the jury without talking about the facts of the particular case. I, I, I think uh, I think you can commit the jury without talking about the facts. Right. Yes. Yeah. And you can yeah. do it improperly as well. Right. right? Yes. So <laughs> and this is the, so. So the two objections that every defense lawyer should be prepared to make at every moment during the prosecutor's voir dire is a improper instruction on the law and b improper commitment question. Right? And you need to know what an improper commitment question is, and you need to know what the law is and how it relates to your case. I remember you put on a CLE. And we used to do CLEs down at Beer Peretti's. Yeah. yeah, that was a great one. And you did, uh, you did PowerPoint presentations, and you did hypos as to what's a commitment question and what's not a commitment question. You know, there was one where, um, can you be fair if you hear evidence that somebody was chopped up, put in a freezer, and then cooked and eaten later? Right. Right? Right. So a proper commitment question includes only the facts necessary to commit the juror to following the law. So if you add in extra facts, it makes the commitment question improper. But back to the, the caller's question. Right, right. Right. So back to the caller's question. I want to present the, a, a hypothetical situation to the jury that allows them to, that doesn't leave any blockbuster facts out, right, so that they understand what the evidence is sort of going to show in a case like this. And I want to ask them, what, are, what, what might have happened here? What, how could he not be guilty? And people will suggest things. And some Sometimes they'll suggest crazy things that just happen to be my defense. I actually have a theory that, that if the jury doesn't come up with your story, it's not a very good story. Huh. That if the jury doesn't come up with your defense, it's probably not a very good defense. Are you, and are you weaving this defense through the questions and how you're interacting in Vordar? And if so, how? No. No, I'm not. I am, I'm not trying to lead them to it. I am, hope, I am I'm getting to a point where I can say, look, okay, so hypothetically, you know, we've talked about the law a little bit. We've talked to, you know, the prosecutor is probably, so if it's a, a self-defense case, the prosecutor has probably already talked about self-defense. There's nothing I can do right. about that. But it's still not my suggestion. It's the prosecutor's suggestion. The prosecutor has suggested self-defense. That's even better than the jury suggesting self-defense. Because I can say, okay, you know, suppose that, that you know, somebody kills somebody else. And there's no question that he kills that other person. How could he not be guilty of murder? And people say, well, you know, maybe it was an accident. And that's, yeah, that's, that's true. Maybe this, maybe that, maybe it was self-defense. Maybe, you know, maybe he was trying to prevent some other harm. Maybe he was defending a third person. And I just, I'll write them down on a board. Right. right off butcher paper, like these pads of butcher paper, or right. my, my blackboards cool. in this right. other county, right? right? right. right. I just, I write them down. And then when it comes to, to opening statement, I can go back and say, you know what? You guys nailed it in Vordar. This is it. And circle the one that applies. All the others, I've written all the others down. They're not, they're not unimportant, but the, they've right. come up with the one. So I don't want them to just lead them to the one defense. I want them to see that, they're, that it's their process of coming up with them. And then I can say, yeah, you know, you guys were right about that. Is there a story or anecdote or, that you like to talk about in Vordar? In the sense of like, how are you getting, you just go up there and say, I'm Mark, how you doing? Oh, is that like, yeah. I mean, is that how it works? You know, I, 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 I'm... <laughs> I don't know whether to talk about this because I don't want it to get stolen because it's well, such fair, a fair. it's such a it's such a great opening. But they you know they've seen it a couple of times and if they were going to steal it they're going to steal it and they they couldn't do it well anyway. But well, I'll get up and I'll say you know my name's Mark and I like dogs. How many of you like dogs? Right. Well, you did that in the CLE. Yeah. So people raise their hands because everybody lots of people like dogs. I'm not even I don't care who answers. I'm just getting them to respond. Then something else. You know I've got. You know, I'm married and I have two kids. How many of you have kids? My kids are teenagers. How many of, of you have raised teenagers? And, and so what I'm doing is I'm making the connections between me and them. And then I have a segue to something about the facts of the case. So, for example, in a, uh, uh, 
in a child sex case, teenagers, children, uh, my kids aren't entirely, aren't always entirely honest with me. How many of you have had that experience? The kids don't always tell the whole truth, right? Yeah, and, right. And, and then we can get into a discussion of that, but the first portion is just raise the hands, make the connections with the people. On some of, on the Vordar, if you speak of dogs, I put, um, it's not my dog, I say it's my dog, it's not my dog. <laughs> no, but it's, it's a picture that, so I had a Chihuahua that looked like a Taco Bell dog, okay? I mean, any Taco Bell dog looks like the Chihuahua is the Taco Bell dog. Right, right, right. And um, I have this concept when I'm going over, and it's, it's on a screen, and it's the idea of this pack and that they're guard dogs, right? And then in order for the law to get to reasonable suspicion, they got to get past this dog. Oh, interesting. And, and the first, yeah, I like it better than the right, stairs, right? right. right? And, and the first Everybody dog, uses those stair <laughs> yes, steps. I know. And so yeah. the first dog's a Chihuahua. And I say, who here loves dogs? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, let me show you my dog. And here's reasonable suspicion, and it's a Chihuahua. Yeah. And then I, and I say, OK, well, who has this kind of dog? And then uh, the next dog is a, is a British bulldog, you yeah, know, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And then that's probable cause. And it's who has this kind of bulldog? Who has this kind of dog? Oh, yes, my, you know, and we, and we right. got Cerberus right. for beyond a reasonable no, okay. doubt. Okay, no, I did. Let me tell you. Okay, so next one up is a Rottweiler. That's, that, that's clear and convincing. And then beyond reasonable doubt is a pack, yeah. okay? Yeah, yeah. It's a pack. Initially, it was Serbius. Serbius? Cerberus. Cer but I found that, and so you got to get past, the law has to get past this dog to get to reasonable doubt because yeah. this is the guard dog. Yeah. And, you know, who's the guard dogs? We're all the guard dogs, right? That's why I went to a pack instead yeah, yeah. of serving. Twelve of them, I hope. Well, twelve or six. Thirteen. Depending on if it's a six or if a twelve juror. Uh, seven should include you. Well, ooh, uh, strong. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is us. <laughs> I'm t yes, and you're anchoring yes, them. Yeah. Yes, this is us. We are the guard dogs. Yeah. When, and if they're going to get through us to get to that, they got to get through us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I use service uh, once or twice, but it's such an ugly picture. Okay. Yeah. It's an ugly dog. Yeah. And we just went to the Chihuahua. And what's behind Cerberus? Hell is behind Cerberus. Yes. So, yeah. And so, I, I, in right. And so yeah. I changed it to, and then I changed it to a pack. Yeah. Initially, I thought about putting a wolf pack, but I don't think people want to be wolves. Huh. I want to be a wolf. Well, I know, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah. All right, right. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm, some yeah. of us want to be wolves, right? Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I change it to a couple of German shepherds, yeah. it's a, and then it's a couple of pit bulls, and then it's yeah. a couple of beautiful looking dogs, a couple of labs, yeah. Dobermans. Yeah. So they get to get past the, the dogs. So I'll tell you, I will use PowerPoint in Vordire. I will steal one of my adversaries' slides. So, like the puzzle, right? Yeah, right, right. So they use the puzzle of the car. Now they use the giraffes. I don't know what to do they about the giraffes. They use the giraffes. Yeah, yeah, You know, yeah. I can, I'll figure something out. Right. But, but they, they'll use the puzzle of the car, and it's, a, it's an RX-8. And so, you know, I'm a Mark, and I, I love cars. How many of you love cars? Um, and then, I'll, you know, would you put up that slide of the car, please, Madam Prosecutor? Oh, you right? asked them to put yeah. it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'll say, okay, you know, what kind of car is this? And I don't like RX-8s. I never have liked them. I love the RX-7s. That's a beautiful car. The RX-8 just, just, just doesn't look good. But but if you're looking, if you want to buy an RX-8 and you see this picture of the RX-8, are you going to buy the RX-8? Because it's a puzzle and there are pieces right, of the puzzle right, missing. No. And, and what's right. behind the missing piece of the puzzle? No, we're not going to buy that RX-8, right? right? So right. I will, yeah, you know, if they have something that I can steal, I will steal. So I can't wait. And I'm going to reveal my hand on this. Um, so if you, you've seen, so the state of Texas will use... What's beyond reasonable doubt? Here's a picture of this girl with cake on her face, and here's a picture of a, this girl without cake on her face, and then here's another picture of a cake with a missing piece. Who ate the cake? Right, right, right. Right? Right. right. So I'm sitting around with my kids one day, and, I'm, and I have one mm. kid, mm -hmm. and he has cake all over his face, okay? Second kid. No cake on her <laughs> face. All right. And, and he's sitting there like, like this with his fork because he cannot get messy at all. And, and like there's no cake left. And it's like, you know, that we oh, obviously nice. eating the cake. Right. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait. Oh, that's awesome. So I keep them close on my phone. So right. in the event they decide to do that, I'm going to say, oh, let me show my kids. Let me show my, the pictures of my kids. And they both, guess what? They both ate the cake. Yeah. Right? Right. It's just one eats it one one dog. Yeah. I don't, Ooh, know. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't because know. beyond a reasonable know. doubt, the one with the cake on his face still ate the cake. That's true. How about if you have one of your one with the kid with the cake on his face and the other with, with cake all over his hands? Like he just smeared it on the, that, kid, the kid with the cake on his perfect. face. That's so you perfect. zoom out yes, and you see yes, the other yes, kid yes. laughing ah, with cake ah, on his hands. Ah, 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 ah. That's perfect. Yeah. It's genius. Can I may I do that? Yeah. I'm gonna do that. Steal from I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. Steal it all. The other thing that I've used to illustrate beyond reasonable doubt is a a mountain. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's a picture of a mountain, and it'll say, 
<clears throat> at the bottom level, it's reasonable suspicion. And then little, one of my things that, that I didn't like about the stair step because it, I think it, the stair step shows that it's just, you know, one step up equals this, one step up equals this, okay. one step up equals yeah. that. I don't think it's like that. I think, you know, I, so on the, on the mountain, I will do reasonable suspicion, a little bit here, next is uh, probable cause, then a little bit more, is, yeah, yeah. And, then, and then up here is beyond reasonable doubt. Okay. And yeah, yeah. those are types of visuals that I use for beyond reasonable doubt. What are your thoughts on discussing that with the, a potential jurors, or do you even touch it? I think it? I think it can be helpful. I don't, I believe it's a rare case that reasonable doubt wins in Harris County. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think you need to have a, it, you try a case with no story, but I think you're much, much better off if you have a story to tell. If you don't have a story to tell, then the story is reasonable doubt. But I, yeah, I, I, I think that those images are a useful illustration. And I've heard jurors say, yeah, oh, that picture really, really made it clear for me. Well, um, it, 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 it sucks. And I have one. I, you know, I have a lovely one. I just, I, I've got other things to spend my time on. Well, and that's you, the thing is we've got a budget of time, sure. right? We can't spend time on everything we want to spend time on. What are your... Oh, okay, you got a felony of order, you have 60 people on the panel, and misdemeanor, you got 30. And you got 30 minutes to do them both. Yeah. Are there things that you cut or don't cut or like to focus on more, or you just, it's just... It's improvised. You know? I, I, I will have a, an outline of three or four topics that I want to do my best to cover, uh, but and beyond that, it's improvised. And if I, you know, I want to get people talking, so if, you know, juror number six says something, I want to ask... Who agrees with juror number six? Or how many of you agree with juror number six? And they're different questions, right? Mm -hmm. Does anybody agree with juror number six? Implies that maybe nobody does. And if you don't want a lot of hands raised, you say, does anybody agree with that, right? How many of you agree with that? Implies that certainly some of you agree with that. And if you want a bunch of hands raised, you say, how many of you agree with that? Interesting, it? right, right, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. right, right, just, right, and, right, right. You know, it's, it's, it's magic and it works. So. I'll just, I'll follow where it leads and I'll try to get my stuff covered and I'll have somebody watching the, the panel for me so I don't have to take a bunch of right. notes. I've got some scaled questions. That's right, okay, next right. thing. What are some, right, let's talk about some so scaled the, questions. So the scaled questions that I, and you know, lawyers like to use scaled questions and I, it's helpful to have a scaled question to make that last couple of calls on your peremptory challenges, right? Do you want to strike juror number 17 or do you want to strike juror number 19? Well, we didn't hear from either of them, but juror number 17 said five to the you know, law enforcement uh, pride question and juror number 19 said one, so let's take juror number 19, right? Uh, the, quest the scaled questions that I have are from the revised legal attitudes questionnaire. I like to do all of this stuff based on at least nominal science, right. right? And you know, it may not be the the tightest science, but but at least there's some basis for for this. There's been some psychological research into how this works. So the theory is that the worst jurors for us, the best jurors for the government, are what's called right wing authoritarians, uh, and they're the people who voted for Trump because Trump was going to make things better, right? right? As opposed to the people who voted for Trump because. LOL, wouldn't it be funny to have Trump as president? Uh, so the right-wing authoritarians are the people who, all else being equal, we want to eliminate. Might be different if we're representing a cop, but in most of our cases, we're not representing cops. So there's the revised legal attitudes questionnaire, which is intended to sort out the, the, uh, the right-wing authoritarians from the others. I don't it's know got, what this re revised legal... It's got 23 scaled questions. Okay. It's got questions like, a person should be required to testify on his own behalf. Or uh, it is more important that a, that a an innocent person go free than a, that a I guilty that person one. be convicted. And then the scale is one to five. It's from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Why is it five? I don't know. It could be four. I do four. Yeah, four. There's no middle ground. I mean, there's no. That's there's the only, no. Three. I don't want threes. Yeah, I don't know. You know, so Likert scaled questions. I think are traditionally one through five. I don't know, but but it's social social science scientists using them, and they may not be, be five. trying to push people to one end or or the other. So, uh, what are some other examples? And then um, did you particularly like to use? Um, I, I use the what's the one thing? I mean, um, more uh, important. Better. Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. You gotta let. You can't let one go down for an innocent. Uh, an innocent person can't go down. It rather. It's easier to let. All right, here it is. It's better to let one go free than to convict an innocent person. Um, yeah. Uh, so so there's one about children. It's something to the effect of, uh, it's more important for children to behave than to be than to be creative. 
something like that. Right. And something about child raising. So none of them are about the facts of my case. They're all just right. people's attitudes about this stuff. I've actually tried a couple times in federal court to get a, a written questionnaire with these questions, and the judges don't like the fact that it's not geared to the facts of the case. Right. But it gives us so much more information than anything geared to the facts of the case would give. What are some, are, are there, so you get a juror information card, are there things that you look for at all? Yes. Okay, what yeah, are some yeah, yeah. things that you just so, like to know about? So, so being a complainant in a criminal case. Oh, interesting. Being involved right. in a criminal case, sure. right? There's that box. Being on a criminal jury, right? All do you else, like them or do no. you not? All else being equal, I want, I want to eliminate the people who have served on a criminal jury before. A couple of reasons. One is the prosecutor has accepted them before. I, why would I Fair accept enough. them now? Right. Another is that if they acquitted before, the prosecutor probably poisoned them by saying, oh, you know, what you didn't know about this case right. is, and there's that ethical violation where right. they're trying to influence jurors' future jury service, and I think prosecutors do it all the damn time. Right. And so I don't want to take the risk that some, I don't want somebody, I don't want this to be somebody's second jury service. What about individuals who have, ha who have criminal histories? What about them? I have found that those, I'm not all, all right, some, I have, I have found that when they have criminal histories and they're sitting on a jury, and if they got it, they want them to get it too. Hmm. I think it depends. It depends on the I, people. And, and I think so. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. And and yeah, that may be more common than the other situation, which is, I'm gonna, <clears throat> you know, I went through this thing, and I'm not going to make you go through it. Right. Uh, but people with criminal histories, come on, let's face it, the state's probably going to strike them. Well, I, they typically find them with, like, DWIs, for example, yeah. um, and it's an assault case or something, and he has yeah. a prior DWI somewhere else. Or Yeah, and the state doesn't generally strike them? I, they've come on. They, I mean, yes. Typically, the answer is yes. But they sometimes they come on the jury. They, I, yeah. I, I say, you know what? Come on. No, they don't. They don't okay. It doesn't help. We had, yeah, we had, a, <laughs> we had a jury selection last week where one of the jurors <clears throat> had a burglary. The prosecutor said, "This juror has a burglary," and of course, a felony conviction makes a person in, ineligible to serve on the jury. Uh, okay, was that a deferred or was it a conviction? Uh, uh, I don't know. Doesn't and they mean looked the it same up. Thing? And they looked it I'm up. Kidding. And no, it wasn't to the defendant. It was to the prosecutor. <laughs> we didn't talk about it with the defendant. The prosecutor just thought that they were going to exclude this juror because of this this burglary uh, right. thing. Right. And I, I asked if it was a deferred, and they went and they looked it up, and sure enough, it was a deferred. Sorry, prosecutor. Sorry. You're gonna, you want to get Sorry. rid of that person? You're going to have to strike him. What are some other things that you look for in the jury information? So on the forms, I kind of want to know. It depends. So if it's a case with kids, like I said, I want to look at the range of ages of kids that the people have. If it's a case where there's an allegation of a false report, especially due to a divorce, I want to look for the people who are divorced, and I want to make note of them. Because it may not be something we talk about. It may not be something that, that I call to anybody's attention. But if we get down to that last cut, and it's a choice between a guy with teenage kids who's been divorced and and a guy with teenage kids who's still married, I might want to get rid of the guy who's still married and keep the guy who's divorced just on the off chance that there's been a false accusation made against him or that he's had to think about the possibility of that. Have you found that an age, that age plays into a factor as to what type of juror that you want? No. See, I, I go back and forth. I don't know. I have found that these younger jurors their ideas are, they're willing to accept or maybe not be so right-wing authoritarian or maybe are challenging some things more than... Well, yeah, so, so sure. P young, younger people are generally less <clears throat> toward the right, right? Um, and that's just, a, that's a function. I mean, that's a, you know, it's like two bell curves, right? And one's shifted a little bit to the right of the other. If I didn't have any other information, I might pick the younger person over the older person, but I always have more information than that. Do you do you look into education at all? Or Sometimes. It depends on the case. Uh, it depends on the case. I, I might have a case that's very brainy, right? That's mm -hmm. a very intellectual case, and I might want people who are more educated. Or I might have a case that's not so intellectual, and, and I'm, it might not matter to me. Or I might want to adjust the mix of people on the jury, right? There's that, there's that guy, and, and he's got a PhD, and if he's on the jury, he's probably going to be the foreman, right? Or there's a good chance that he's, he's the foreman, and he's the leader of the jury, and I didn't get such a great feeling from him as I did from you know, the guy next to him. So if I'm going to choose to strike one or the other, I'll take the guy with less education who I'm more comfortable with rather than the guy with more education who's likely to be the, the foreman. Have you been in a position where, you picked, where you're able to predict the foreman? Yeah. Like from Vordar yeah, yeah, to yeah. end? Yeah. Yeah, Isn't yeah. that cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> That's well, super cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> super cool. Yeah. It's There's tough. our foreman. 
It's tough. <laughs> well, I've, I've had several occasions where I've been very confident about it and been wrong. Oh, right. I, right. So, I understand. But, that. you know, one time out of 12, I'm, I'm right, at least. <clears throat> That's hard to do. <clears throat> we are just talking it up, and we have a caller. <clears throat> where are you at, caller? What about teachers and nurses? Uh, popular idea that 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 uh, you know teachers and nurses are 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 you know special category of of people who be, should be looked at especially you know so nurses nurses deal a lot with cops often cops are married to nurses often cops are divorced from nurses um, cop nurses see the damage that's done to you know the damage that's done by crime. Yeah, uh, nurses have some uh, medical knowledge, and so if it's a, a scientific case, then you might not you, know, you might not want them bringing that right. knowledge in. Right. Teachers, you know, on the one hand, they they deal with kids, and so in a in a case involving kids, they might be biased toward the state. On the other hand, you know, they're generally more more left leaning and compassionate people than than a lot of other professions. So I'd I'd take it case by case. I don't follow any sort of so I don't follow any sort of demographic sure. predictions at all. Uh, you know, there's that Clarence Darrow quote, right? Do you, do you know about this, where he's talking about the different kinds of jurors, and you know, there's the there's the Lutheran, and you don't want the Lutheran on your jury because he's got no sense of humor, but you do want the Irishman because the Irishman likes to drink a pint. He's got a great sense of humor. <laughs> um, I don't subscribe to any of it. You know, Clarence Darrow was one of the greatest trial lawyers ever, and and he definitely knew what he was talking about. I don't subscribe to it and I think that maybe times have moved on from that. I think maybe the Irish and the and the Lutherans live close enough together that you can't predict which one's going to be the better juror for the for the uh, defense. Let's talk about um, creating that presence or charisma. There's a trick that you that, that I remember you you talking about something about you know, you grab your hand and it's supposed, or, or you, you remember something in your mind and, and you do this and, and, and then when you're speaking, um, the way your tone is and how you're projecting, um, so, the jurors can feel it. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you really listen well, JV. <laughs> Dude, I'm, 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 a, I'm a practitioner. Wow. Loop that's through so the cool. work zone. Yeah. So this is, this is, this, this is a neuro-linguistic programming trick, right? You, you set a trigger and it's, a, and when you set a trigger, you can, you can give it some, value and then you can retrieve what's on that trigger later by setting off the trigger. So trigger that I've used taught this by was taught this by my hypnosis teacher Mike Mandel. Uh, if you you touch these fingers together and it's these fingers because you don't often go through the day touching these fingers. So you're not likely to accidentally trigger that. And you look at it and you say awesome. And that sets that you have to see awesome. 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 All right. And so you do that when you're feeling really good. You're feeling really good, awesome, right? So something really good happens, awesome. I'm here with my friend JV on the television, awesome, awesome right? right? Awesome. And then when you get into a situation where you need some of that, you're not feeling it, just just bring it back and, and hit the trigger and, and look at it, and it brings back some of that feeling, right? So this is what we did in the Vordire thing, was we got in we got in a hero pose, right? Right, where, right, where, right, 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 super, right, right. We're right, superheroes. Right. I'm the world's greatest trial lawyer. Nobody can defeat me, awesome. Right, and then if, you know when you need it before you pick a jury, you, you can come back to that. That's really important. That that mood that you go in before you stand up and say those first few words is so important because the jury figures out who you are in the first ten seconds, maybe okay. before. This is a gnat. Yeah, it's a gnat. It's fine. It's, I'm going to eat it next time it comes <laughs> by. Watch me. Uh, so the jury in the first. 10 seconds that they see you, they figure out who you are and they figure out whether they'd like to have a beer with you. And if you're the guy who comes in and, and it feels like the superhero, right? And it's showtime and I'm gonna have some fun here, then they're gonna like you. And if you come in and you're sad sack and, and you're scared and you're worried and boy, I don't like any of these people, they're not gonna like you either. Now, you know, we, you don't have to be don't fake it, right? right and right. and you know, I am right. I'm anxious every time I go in to pick a jury. But that's not being anxious and being able to admit that I'm anxious is not different. Is no different than Showtime. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to these people because if you know, if however I'm feeling, I might start off early on by talking about that. Um, we got about two minutes left. Big top top three tips to to give a practitioner that's getting ready for jury trial. What are the, what? Yes. Come on. Awesome. What are... Num number three, right? Relax. Okay. Number two, know your stuff inside and out. 
right? You got to know what's in your charging instrument. I had a trial with a with a young lawyer recently where he was not as familiar with his charging instrument as as he should have been. So the prosecutor started to to say stuff, and I had to nudge him to say, "Look, hey, you know, that's look at your look at your charge here. That's not in the jury charge." Listen, uh. right? So that's, listening is the most important thing in jury selection. What's important is not what you're saying to them. What's important is what they're saying to you. Sure. And if you don't listen to them, you're losing 90% of the value of jury selection. And this is a problem with PowerPoints and other scripts, right? If you have a script, you want to follow the script. Well, guess what? They don't have the script. And so the first comment that they have that's off the script, what do you want to do? Well, you want to get back on the script. Right. Because you have your script. You're prepared for the script. It's the worst thing. Right. So you, you don't listen and you don't respond appropriately to what they're saying. Anecdote. Prosecutor, we're, we're, we're picking a jury on a, uh, you know, a DWI or something. Um, and one of the jurors says, uh, um, you know, my, my brother-in-law was, uh, um, was killed by a drunk driver. And the prosecutor says, well, who else feels that way? You know, but you know, moves, like, tries, to move it, tries to move it to the rest of the right, panel, right? right, right you know, right. I'm, um, you know, what do you do when somebody says, my, you know, my brother-in-law was killed by a drunk driver? Right. What do you do? Uh, what would I do? What would you do? What do you do? Uh, I would say, thank you for sharing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> right. I'm so sorry. <laughs> right? What else? You know, we're, you. we're still human beings. Right, right, right. right? right. We're right. picking a jury, but we're still human beings. Right. And they're human beings, so we treat them like human beings. And, and yeah, you, that might be the, the worst thing that you could hear in your case because right. you don't want everybody else thinking <clears throat> your client could have killed somebody, but, you know, they're still a human being, and right. so you give them the human reaction, and, and you've listened to them, and you've honored them, and you get so much more benefit from that than by thinking, oh, no, they've poisoned the, the pool. Yeah, the jury pool doesn't get poisoned. These people, their minds are not going to be changed by anything that happens in jury selection. <laughs> and with that, uh, Mark Bennett, drawer wizard, loop theorist, hypnotist, extraordinaire, thank you for being on the show. Thanks, JV. Thank you so much. For all of us here at HCLA, adios, amigo. Cool, we're fun. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs>